Good morning and welcome to worship for 5e and Rothy Norman. We begin with Psalm 20. Let us worship God. The Lord answer you in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favour your burnt sacrifices. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfil all your plans. May we shout for joy over your victory and in the name of God set up our banners. May the Lord fulfil all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord will help his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with mighty victories by his right hand. Some take pride in chariots and some in horses but our pride is in the name of the Lord our God. They will collapse and fall, but we shall rise and stand upright. Give victory to the King, O Lord. Answer us when we call. Let us pray. Almighty God, reader of hearts, minds and souls, we come to you in worship, in the quiet space of meeting, Fill us with the delight of this time and space to spend with you. Whether we feel as important as a king or a prophet or as overlooked as the youngest shepherd boy. In your eyes we are all valued, all seen. In a time when we have seen so few other people for so long, we find it easy to feel invisible, unconsidered, forgotten. Jesus told us that you know all about us, from the number of hairs on our heads to the deepest desires of our souls. Nothing is hidden. May we come into your presence with the joy of the young David. May we feel as sent by you as the prophet Samuel. May we feel that you can and will use us to rebuild the life of faith in our time and place. We pray for our scattered family of these congregations. For those who feel disconnected from the way they used to go to church and unwilling to risk the sanitizer and face masks. For those who are grieving the loss of people they loved and find it hard to sit with others. For those who are afraid of the future and cannot see how they will cope in a changed world and a changed church. Give us all courage, we pray, and the willingness to take on the tasks you appoint to us even when everyone around us is surprised and even judgmental. Young boy and old prophet united to serve your purpose. May we find the same united purpose across our congregations and presbyteries. Forgive us for fearing that you have abandoned us to change when in reality you are directing the change just as you always have, just as you always will until your kingdom comes. Hear our prayers and accept the worship of our hearts, turned now and always to you. This we ask, in the holy name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's listen for God's word, as we read from the first book of the prophet Samuel, in chapter 15, beginning at verse 34. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went to his house in Gibeah, Saul, Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death, but Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord was sorry that he had made Saul king over Israel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. 
Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely that's the Lord anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see, they look on outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. We also read from Mark's Gospel in chapter 4, beginning at verse 26. Jesus also said, The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground, and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself, first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle, because the harvest has come. He also said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will we use for it? It's like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs, and puts forth large branches, so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables he spoke the word to them, as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. Amen. May God add his blessing to these readings from his holy word. To his name be praise and glory. On the day when Samuel parted ways with Saul, the chosen king, he was devastated. The people had asked for a king to lead them. They wanted a human level between them and God. And God had obliged and Samuel had laid the oil upon Saul and blessed his choosing. But Saul had not pleased God. He was a good king according to the histories of Israel. But a good leader is not always able to conform to the laws of God. There are the compromises of power to consider and the great temptation to go your own way and exercise that power without listening to what God is saying. For the leaders of most of our countries in this world, this would not be a problem. But ancient Israel is not most countries. Ancient Israel in that time was the chosen people of God. Of them, God was forging the kingdom. Their king had a responsibility to lead according to the ways of God and to listen to God for that direction. Trouble in the land of faith always occurs when people stop listening to God. Excuse me. <clears throat> Saul was no longer listening to the word of God or to God's messenger, the prophet Samuel. Samuel's work on God's behalf seemed to have failed in its purpose, but God had another direction to take, another choice. 
God had already chosen to replace Saul with someone else, and so the prophet Samuel was sent to Jesse's farm near Bethlehem. Samuel was sent to commit treason according to the laws of most countries, and he was afraid. So was Jesse and the other elders of Bethlehem when they saw Samuel coming. But hearing that Samuel came in peace to offer a sacrifice, they welcomed him in. Samuel sanctified all of those who were present for the sacrifice, especially the sons of Jesse. All the while he maintained an internal dialogue with God, wondering which one was to be chosen. But the Lord dismissed them all one by one, not the handsome one, not the strong one, not the wise one, none of them were the right one. Did Jesse have any more sons? Just the youngest one, the shepherd boy of no account, out on the hills with the sheep. No one had even thought to invite the youngest to this adult-only ceremony. But when David was summoned, Samuel heard God's choice and anointed him with a sacred oil that dedicated him to the service of God as king. But this was the first step only, and from that day David changed. The Spirit of God moulded him to become the warrior shepherd king that God's people needed. There would be years of struggle and pain ahead before the crown rested on the new king's head. David himself became all too aware of the glory of Saul and Jonathan, his rightful heir. The Bible tells us that he wept over them, even after he had been persecuted by Saul and maltreated after service wholeheartedly given. God waited until David had grown and used all his experience of life to form him into a king beloved by those whom he ruled. Beloved, but still not perfect. For David too had his faults and foibles. But he differed from Saul in that he listened when God spoke and he accepted the punishment for the things that he did wrong without rancour. He kept the humility of the servant within the role of the king. In the Bible he was the archetypal good king, even though he did some terrible things and was not perfect. He served God, and he atoned, and he honoured God. His descendant, Jesus Christ, had no role as king upon the earth. He was a carpenter, a teacher, a healer, a prophet, and more than that, he was not just the servant of God, he was the son of God. To serve God's will, he came into the world with no defence of rank or privilege. David's family had long ago become ordinary. There were no more kings of Israel or Judah, just petty kings appointed by the conquering Romans, not even related to the people. Jesus was not anointed by a prophet, but he was baptised by the last prophet, by John the Baptist, along with thousands of others whose hearts were turning back to God in repentance. Thousands who were hoping for change and a time when God's kingdom would be more important than anything else. People like us, in other words. Jesus spoke about God's kingdom to all those who were willing to listen. The role of ancient Israel in being that kingdom had failed. Now God would try something else. God would try to build that kingdom in small ways in the hearts of those who listened and in a huge way in the person of Jesus himself through his life, his death and his resurrection. Jesus did not claim the authority of kingship, nor even the status of God's son. He referred to himself always as the son of man, in other words, as a human being. His kingdom did not belong to this world, as he famously told Pontius Pilate. He modelled a different kind of power, the power of humility and service and dedication to God, the model of power which we are also called to use as church communities 
and in church structures. Trouble always starts when church leaders forget the humility of listening to God and listening for God. We should not forget that Jesus' power became the path to our reconciliation with God through sacrifice. In our time, sacrifice. The sacrifice offered by Samuel of all his dreams for Israel's king. The sacrifice offered by God when he sent Jesus into the world and the sacrifice that Jesus made out of love and service. These are our guiding principles and these are the big things of faith. While he was teaching, however, Jesus focused on small things, <clears throat> as we heard in the parables from Mark's Gospel. The first one shows us a farmer planting tiny seeds into the ground, planting in the faith that there will be a harvest, doing his part in partnership with nature and with God. Under the ground the seeds germinate, while the soil looks barren or full of weeds, when the weather is cold and the water levels never quite right. There is so much a farmer cannot control in the growing partnership and yet, there is a harvest from the planted seeds. Jesus went on to take the example of the smallest seed that he knew, the mustard seed. Planted into the ground, it takes off to become a huge rambling bush of a plant that clambers over everything in its path and provides shelter for birds and other creatures. Its rampant growth may not be welcomed by all, but it's practically unstoppable. He did not explain that parable to everyone who was listening. He explained it later to those who had already become his partners in the work of God. Those who would become the leaders of the community of faith after he left this world. The truths expressed through parables can only be understood by those who take up their partnership with Jesus the teacher and who are willing to listen and to let the lessons sink into their hearts minds and souls. Just as David the shepherd was not the king he would become, so the disciples were not the leaders they would become. Just as the seeds were not the crops and plants that they would become. There were so many lessons, so many variables of experience that went into the formation of King David, of Jesus, of the disciples, and still form the life of God's kingdom lived on earth, but not of this world. God's leaders can never be proud wielders of power, only servant leaders, for the time they are called in and for. The other part of leadership that Jesus modelled and Saul did not was knowing when it was time to pass the role of leader on to someone else. In our world, it is very rare to see anyone do this with dignity. We are too used to dictators who seize power by military might and never lay it down, or elected leaders who end up ousted by their own political parties when they cannot read the writing on the wall. That someone would actually lay down power and not seek to continue to use it is a foreign idea to many human leaders. Where democracy flourishes, we become used to the ousting of leaders by proper democratic process and we do not fear such changes, or at least we didn't. But where power is seized and held, every change of power is a battle, often costing the lives of others on either side of the struggle. This is not the way of God. The kingdom of Jesus Christ was not of this world, and yet it must also exist in this world, in the hearts of those who are God's partners in this life, through faith. When we focus on the leadership models of the top, we forget the leadership model at the soil level. Here, everyone who plants for God is a leader, an enabler. Human hands, hands plant the seeds of God in the hearts and minds of those around them, in many small but significant ways. Planted into the soil of our communal life, 
the idea of the growth of new things, fertilised by the decayed remains of what has gone before, leads to the growth of new life. The sacrifice that we give in service to God is the shape of life we thought we would have. The life that God shapes is the seed of that which comes after us, the harvest of our partnership with God in our lifetime. For King David, his legacy was not fully seen for 800 years until that night in Bethlehem when Jesus was born. For us, our legacy will not be seen until the harvest of faith in generations to come. Our job now is to plant the seeds of the kingdom of God, knowing that God will grow the crop into the shape that the world needs in years to come. In this we are God's partners, in small actions done by all who believe that God can direct towards the huge change that will be his kingdom becoming real upon the earth. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you led your disciples into new forms of leadership, laying down all the honour and privilege of your position. You came down from heaven to earth to lighten our darkness, to heal our sickness, to forgive our sins, to restore our souls, to plant in us the seeds of your kingdom, where there is no more suffering, no more pain, no more poverty, no more injustice. And we long for that kingdom. Every time we turn on the news or read the paper and see the distress of our neighbours across the earth and the growing threat to all life on the planet, we pray for all those carrying on your work in healing and teaching, in hospitals and laboratories, in schools, colleges and universities. We pray for those showing your love in action and caring for the poor, in standing up to injustice wherever it is to be found. We pray for those grieving over loved ones lost to COVID or to other illnesses, to accident, to violence and to hatred upon our streets. May the day come when streets are safe for everyone to use, the day when no one sees division in difference, where tolerance makes understanding possible. From small seeds growing to trees to shelter all your children, may love grow and flourish, rooted in faith and hope. To you we pray for those whom we love and those whom we struggle to love, for those with whom we disagree and those with whom we work in common cause. And in silence now, we bring to you the unspoken prayers of our hearts, reaching out to you on behalf of those whom we know who are in trouble. Hear our prayers, Lord, and may all that we think, say and do bring honour to your holy name, in which we pray as you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever. Amen. Go now in peace, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you, this day and for evermore. Amen.